If you were stranded on a deserted island, solely occupied by roving packs of man-eating feral dogs, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the hellhounds in The Breed. It's said the dog is man's best friend, but for these five college kids, nothing could be further from the truth. If they want to survive, they'll have to remind these angry doggos why humanity's at the top of the food chain. I hope no one here is a dog lover. Luke and Jenny are lost at sea. See. What started out as a simple booze cruise is now on the verge of a full-blown survival situation, but apparently they're both too dog sh hammered to actually give a fuck. It seems their luck might be changing, however, as Jenny spots an island off on the horizon. Completely ignoring the barbed wire and keep out sign, the couple comes to a port at a small floating dock, and before Luke can even finish tying up, Jenny stumbles off into the woods in search of a poolside bar. After a short walk through the undergrowth, she happens upon a fenced-in area containing a pair of derelict old buildings. Jenny calls out to anyone that might be around, but getting no response, she decides to continue wandering aimlessly through the forest. Suddenly, she hears something moving in the nearby vegetation. The sounds quickly begin to multiply in all directions, culminating in a vicious bark from right beside her. Jenny takes off in a dead sprint, eventually putting her back to a narrow tree trunk, but it's not enough to fool her pursuers. The unseen attackers take Jenny to the ground and drag her screaming through the brush, never to be seen again. There's nothing wrong with enjoying a drink or two out on the water, but getting so bombed you can't even tell when you might be in mortal danger is a great way to end up as fish food. Judging by the size of the sailboat, Luke and Jenny can't be all that far from shore, but we should still try to take the situation seriously. Now would be a great time to fire up the radio we definitely should have brought to try and make contact with anyone nearby. It's not necessarily time to call in the Coast Guard, but it just might come to that if one of us should require medical attention so far away away from the mainland. Finding an island like this could either be a blessing or a curse, depending on who runs the place. Again, we can't be that far out, meaning it's gotta be on the map, but it could be home to anything from a sandals resort to a former nuclear test site. And we all know how that ends up for the ditzy newcomers. So we should try and figure out what exactly we're about to get ourselves into before coming into port. If I couldn't raise the harbor master via radio, I'd consider sailing around the perimeter of the island to see if we could spot any the occupied buildings. The last thing we want is for authorities to think we're deliberately sneaking into a restricted area, or worse yet, some local drug lord thinking we've come to spy on his operation. A keep out sign in barbed wire doesn't exactly scream two for one fishbowl margaritas. Seeing this, I would try to find a more inviting place to dock, if not leave the island entirely. After all, it's not like we're talking to our volleyball yet. We should just sober up and dedicate as much collective brain power as possible to navigating our way back home. I'm sure Jenny was joking when she said that she was looking for the bar, but what the hell was she in such a hurry to find? Also, Luke's a fucking dumbass for letting her wander off alone like that. It'd be one thing if there was a paved path leading inland that she could follow, but letting your semi-blacked out girlfriend go trailblazing on a mysterious island is exactly how you wind up back on Tinder. This facility we've stumbled upon looks like the kind of place that you'd be looting in PUBG. It seems pretty obvious no one's been around in some time. So when we get no reply from anyone inside, we should turn right around and head straight back to the boat. It's not like there was a sign pointing to the nearest Dairy Queen. As soon as we hear shit rustling around beside us, we should put her back against a big tree and pick up something solid that we can use to defend ourselves. A pointed stick or even a rock will go a lot further than a fist against a wild animal. Running aimlessly like Jenny does only guarantees that we'll die tired. There's pretty much nothing in nature capable of killing a human that we can outrun, so our best option is to look like less of an appetizer. Judging by the barking sound, we're dealing with either wolves or some kind of feral dogs, so climbing up a tree might be enough to get us out of harm's way. Of course, once we're down on the ground, it's situation critical. We need to do everything we can to protect our throat, as we're only a single well-placed bite away from hosing the ground with 5 liters of cherry juice. Curling up in the fetal position might be an option if we know help is on the
the way, but otherwise it'd just be death by a thousand cuts. We'll have to fight back with everything we've got, specifically targeting vulnerable areas like eyes and snouts. We're probably not getting out of this with all of our fingers, but if we can get back on our feet, we've at least got a chance. Sometimes it ain't about the sharp stick you pick up to defend yourself from rabid dogs. Sometimes it's about proactive upward mobility. Why fight when you can rest on your laurels? That's why you would need to get yourself a lordship or ladyship title pack from our sponsor, Established Titles. These titles grant you at least one square foot of dedicated land on a private estate in Scotland, along with an official crested certificate. Maybe it doesn't come with an all-season pass to the Coliseum Games, but it is an affirmation that you're a free human, like Gannicus's Rudis. Didn't work out too hot for him, but he did stab it into a Roman mercenary's neck, so don't leave your established title certificate inside a deceased politician's neck and you should be fine, especially since each certificate has your unique plot number containing the exact searchable location of your land. It can be lonely at the top, which is why you need to establish some titles and break your girlfriend and fam out of the peasant's wagon cages. Then you can all skip through the tulip fields to Scotland to check out your unique plot, which may be a bit tiny if you cheaped out on the title. That doesn't matter because you're still technically a lord and with a tree planted every order, you're literally creating oxygen. If you're sweaty, slap your lord title on tender credit cards or plane tickets. Unless you fancy mud fighting Ramsey Bolton's bloodhounds, use code NERDEXPLAINS to get 10% off. Don't forget Father's Day. Unshackle him from the mines with this great last minute gift. Sometime later, brothers Matt and John arrive at the island by seaplane to visit their late uncle's old homestead, along for the rider Matt's girlfriend Nikki and longtime friends Noah and Sarah. After setting in with some Mark Margarita fueled zipline shenanigans and turning the old playground equipment into a death trap, the gang lays out to watch John partake in a little archery practice. Only, they're not alone. Something starts rustling around in the nearby bushes. Suddenly, the unknown entity emerges from the shadows, revealing itself to be just a tiny doggo. The little heartbreaker immediately becomes a fan favorite, and is quick to be adopted by the friends with zero regard for where it came from and whether he might be carrying any cooties. Later that night, while the 20-somethings are busy killing brain cells, the little furball bolts through an open screen door and disappears back into the darkness from whence it came. Not Wanting to miss out on some midnight puppy cuddles, Sarah and John grab a couple flashlights and head outside. After a brief search, they find the rogue puppers hunkered down in the tall grass. But before Sarah can swoop him up, his unhappy mom or dad leaps out of the bushes and pins her to the ground. The beast runs away as John comes to the rescue, but not before chomping down on Sarah's ankle like it was a milk bone. Back inside, med student Matt renders first aid and suggests they skedaddle before Sarah starts foaming at the mouth. But John John's not about to let a little dog mauling get in the way of his vacation. In his opinion, as an untrained burnout, Sarah has at least a week to begin rabies prophylaxis, so they should just ignore the situation and get back to slamming tequila shots. Matt reluctantly backs his brother's claims, but insists there's no pressure, which is all Sarah needs to throw caution to the wind and carry on with the festivities. Sure, the little tyke is cute and all, but also a major yellow flag that should be taken into consideration. The puppy either belongs to other people currently on the island and fairly close by, or he's the progeny of feral dogs that have lost all fear of humans. Matt and John told their friends they're supposed to be alone on the island, meaning it's probably the second option. I'm not saying we should dropkick the little guy off the nearest bridge, but it might not be a bad idea to turn him loose in case any of his relatives are out looking for him. Eventually, the problem almost solves itself, but Sarah and John just had to go chase tail. Mama's dog sneak attack happens way too fast for us to avoid it, but once we're flat on our back, we should immediately cover our face and throat with our arms so we can stay alive long enough for John to come whack it with a mag light. It's odd that the dog would take the time to dish out a vindictive bite while on retreat. Such extreme aggression should be taken as a sign that the dog might become a problem later on. This encounter also suggests the puppy was born on the island to feral parents, meaning there's got to be at least one other their big ass dog screwing around somewhere, and probably a lot more than that. As for the rabies concern, we need to pile into the plane in GTFO as soon as John is sober enough to hold the yoke. Yes, it's true that rabies usually takes between 20 days and 3 months to incubate, but there have been cases where symptoms emerged in only 4 days, and once that happens, you are uppercase 
fucked. Hanging around to play King's Cup and shotgun beers with a fatal disease brewing inside you is pretty much Russian roulette. Sure, you probably won't blow your brains out, but if you do, there's no scooping them back in. Rabies aside, there's also the risk of serious bacterial infection that accompanies about half of all recorded dog bites. These kinds of infections are known to cause tissue death if not treated right away, so there's really no good reason why we shouldn't call it quits and fly home with their tail between our legs. Fast forward to the next morning and something is clearly wrong with Sarah. During breakfast, she's aloof, irritable, and ravenous, wolfing down everything in sight and nearly perforating Noah for trying to take the last pancake, entirely unconcerned with her bizarre behavior. John, Matt, and Noah head into the woods with a bow for a little ATM shooting. A short ways into their hike, Noah breaks off from the brothers to snap some photos of the local wildlife, but quickly gets more than he bargained for when he comes face to face with another stray dog. He turns his back on the menacing mutt only to find two more sneaking up behind him. Noah shouts for help before tearing ass through the forest, which naturally results in him tripping over nothing and falling flat on his face. Fortunately, Matt and John find him before the dogs do. Noah explains what he just saw, but his friends brush it off as a little sinophobia. From out of nowhere, a badly injured Luke wordlessly creeps up behind them. The human shoot toy cryptically warns them that the dogs don't want them there, but takes a Belgian Malinois to the face before he can elaborate further. Matt tries to rush in to help, but John holds him back, watching in horror as the stranger is savagely torn apart. Almost as soon as the screaming stops, the pack sets its sights on live prey, prompting the three men to haul ass back to the house. Upon reaching the hill overlooking the property, they realize they've been cut off by another group of dogs. Meanwhile, Sarah and Nikki are just coming in off the docks. Matt shouts at them to run like hell, and just like that, the race is on. Just as they make it to the front door, one of the dogs latches onto Nikki's pant leg. Matt goes in to help, but once again, John calls him off, knocking an arrow to his recurve and letting it fly directly into the meat of Nikki's calf. Overwhelmed by secondhand embarrassment, the dog flees the scene out of pure cringe, giving the gang time to drag their wounded friend back into the house. Looks like John could use a little more practice. Seriously though, we know that there's at least one large aggressive dog on the island, so maybe leaving our small and injured friend alone with another small person is a bad idea. This is also why Noah shouldn't split off on his own to stare at flowers through a narrow ass viewfinder. He's lucky the dogs didn't come after him. I would have tried to keep all the threats in front of me and backed away slowly while calling for my friends. Breeds like these are known to chase anything that moves, so turning our back on them would almost certainly cause them to attack. Once Noah rejoins the others, John's an idiot for not taking his claim seriously. He's seen firsthand the size and aggressive nature of at least one of the dogs on the island, so the fact that there are several more of them should be an immediate cause for alarm. At this point, we should have an arrow knocked in the bow at all times. Meanwhile, the others should pick up long branches that they can use to keep the dogs at a distance. If we're attacked, Noah and Matt can keep the mutts at an arm's length, while John picks them off one at a time, provided he can actually hit what he's aiming at. I get Luke's probably delirious from blood loss, but if I were in his shoes, I would have tried asking for help instead of muttering some half-baked nonsense no one's going to understand. This might have allowed us to get closer to the three men without them treating us like a fucking zombie. Standing so far away only makes it easier for the dogs to single us out. While the pack was busy tearing Luke apart, this would be a prime opportunity for John to test his aim on something with a face. The dogs are more or less stationary while they rip into their prey, giving us a good shot as we're likely to get into this situation. Yeah, we only have so many arrows, but if we're able to keep the stranger alive, he might be able to share some valuable insights into the current state of the island, or just how many dogs we might be dealing with here. At the very least, he's another pair of hands to fight off the mongrels. As soon as we make it back to the property, our goal should be to get straight into the plane and put this place behind us as soon as possible, then have animal control nuke the place from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. Nikki and Sarah are literally right next to the plane when they see the dogs, so if I were them, I would have taken the path of least resistance and climbed into the cockpit instead of staking our survival on an inner species foot race, especially since Sarah's got a wounded leg. A single dog grabbing Nikki by the pant leg is easily something the five of us could have dealt with unarmed. Just surround the mutt and kick its f***ing ass. There was absolutely no need for 
John to play Legolas here. If anything, I would have just taken a running start and booted it right in the face. If there were really no other option, I don't know, maybe aim for the part of the dog not directly attached to your friend's leg? I'm no Steven Ranella, but I would have at least tried to ensure that if I missed, I'd hit anything but the other person. While Nikki slugs back some tequila, Matt snips the head off the arrow with a pair of wire cutters and yanks the shaft from her bleeding leg like a true medical professional. As the group reviews just how fucked up the situation is, Matt brings up the fact that there used to be a training facility for seeing eye dogs on the island, which he speculates could have been secretly training attack dogs. He goes on to say that the place was reportedly closed down after a rabies outbreak forced them to euthanize all the animals, and any that might have escaped would have almost certainly died from disease years ago. Just then, Sarah starts spouting off the same mysterious bullshit as Luke right before he got got. Noticing this, Noah tells everyone it's time to get the hell out of there, but the doggos also get a vote. One of the crazed canines flies into a nearby window and knocks no one on his ass before charging straight at Sarah. Just before it can close the distance, John comes in and clutch with a chokehold, buying enough time for Matt to put it down with the fire poker. Having had it with this dog show, the gang packs their shit and makes for the seaplane, only to find it thoroughly puppy guarded. They go back inside to come up with a new plan, when suddenly Noah spots the plane drifting out to sea. With no critters in sight, everyone heads down to the water to try and recover their ticket home before it's too late. Evidently, the dogs chew through the rope securing the plane to the dock, although Matt is certain they couldn't have known to do this on purpose. John sheds his gear and dives right in, but just as he's about to reclaim their ride, the plane rotates to reveal a pair of pooches perched up on the wing. He manages to swim back to shore before they can catch him, but more dogs are beginning to arrive on the scene. Fortunately, Noah is able to bat them all home before the rest of the pack can join in on the action. If Matt's really in med school, he should know the last thing that they would want to do is pull the arrow out of Nikki's calf, especially this far away from proper medical treatment. I would use the wire cutters to trim down the shaft on either side of her leg and then bandage it up as much as possible. The arrow itself is actually working to control the bleeding, so pulling it out would really open up the floodgates. And if it so much as nicked her tibial artery, she'd be dead in under 10 minutes. Attack dogs or not, these mutts are clearly determined to make us dinner, and this house won't hold them back forever. As we see with the dog that jumped in through the window, they die just like everything else. So we should scour the place for weapons we can use to thin out the herd. Fire pokers are a great start, but we could also fasten kitchen knives to broom handles to make improvised peasant spears. I would tape some old magazines to my extremities World War Z style to nullify their biting power. It's not like we're dealing with bears or big cats that can use their claws to tear us up. As long as the dogs can't sink their teeth into us, they should be easy enough to fend off with their 2x4 technology. Once we're sufficiently kitted up, we'll need a distraction to buy us time to move the wounded. I would take all the food we brought for the trip and dump it outside on the opposite side of the house, along with the dead dog. As soon as the pack came in to chow down, we make for the plane as quickly as possible. Of course, I doubt anyone could have expected the dogs would cut the plane loose like that. This development drastically moves up our timeline. We need to immediately drop anything that can't kill a dog and run like hell for the dogs. If we lose the plane, then two of us are for sure going to die from untreated infections, and the rest of us won't last long once we run out of supplies, so it's well worth potentially getting caught out in the open to salvage our only means of escape. Two dogs jumping into the water doesn't mean we should abandon our best hope for survival. Pretty much all dog species are extremely vulnerable while swimming, and they can't hold their breath for nearly as long as the average human, so we could simply swim underneath them to reach the plane. Once we climb aboard, the fuselage will be far too slippery for them to climb up after us, and any dogs that get close could easily be held off with kicks to the face. Also, since even our lightest member weighs significantly more than any of the dogs, it'd be pretty easy to just hold them underwater and drown them one at a time, especially if Matt or Noah joined in on the action. Generally speaking, humans would be far better suited to aquatic combat as we can tread water with our legs while striking with our arms. Come to think of it, as long as Sarah and Nikki can swim with her injuries, we should all be diving in to swim out to the plane. It'll save us the trouble of coming back to the dock, and even if every dog on the island jumped in after us, it'd 
be easier to deal with them in the water than on dry land. With a plane drifting out to sea, unless there's a canoe lying around nearby, our only option is to run back to the house. But we really shouldn't have left the front door open like that. For all we know, the place turned into a fucking dog pound the second we left. I'd definitely be preparing myself for a fight the moment we cross the threshold. We'll also want to meticulously clear the place as a group while boarding it up to make sure we don't run into any surprises later on. With no cell service and their only means of escape well out of reach, they board up the house and dig in for the long haul. As soon as the coast is clear, Matt and John dump the dead dog over the side of the porch and quickly retreat inside. Meanwhile, Sarah's starting to run a fever. Matt says it's still too soon for her to be showing symptoms of rabies, but the fever could be a sign she's developed some other kind of infection. Realizing they can't wait around forever, they decide the best move forward is to commandeer their uncle's old Mercedes from the detached garage and use it to drive across the island, despite the old rust bucket not having moved in over a decade. Once on the other side, they'll look for whatever means Luke used to reach the island, or at the very least, try to find some working comms equipment in an old dog training facility. Noah, Matt, and John set out to put the plane into action, but before they can even decide who gets the pleasure of sprinting across open ground to the garage, a pair of angry boys descend on the wrapped up carcass from earlier, prompting the men to nope right back inside. Plan B turns their attention to the old zip line running out over the water. After retrieving the handlebars from the top of the line, Matt rigs it up to the power line running from the attic wall over to a pole on the other side of the garage. Despite his protests and her crippling injury, Nikki volunteers as tribute, citing her smaller stature and elite climbing skills. With her audience beginning to grow, she kicks off from the roof, only to stall out a few yards short of her goal. Just then, a whole pack of SOBs comes running in like someone just shook the bag. Nikki swings her legs up and Commando crawls the rest of the way to the garage. Once inside, she climbs down to the old car without a hitch, but the ancient engine just won't turn over. Suddenly, the furry horde breaches the walls, leaving her barely enough time to gymnastics her way to safety without getting munched on. With Nikki in need of immediate exfil, the four friends concoct a foolproof plan to reel her back in. Old Robin Hood ties some fishing line to the back of an arrow and manages to stick the broadside of the barn without another blue on blue. They then tie a length of climbing rope to the line so she can pull it over and tie it onto her carabiner. Just then, one of the dogs makes it up to her level. Nikki takes a running start and leaps for the handlebars, dangling just above the jaws of death, while Deadeye lines up the shot. John lets loose and ends Airbud's whole career with a single well-placed arrow, and the gang finally pulls Nikki out of harm's way. I understand there's a sense of urgency in getting medical attention for Sarah's rapidly deteriorating condition, but this hastily cobbled together plan could have easily cost them one of their own. A better option might be to slow things down a hair and try to take out as many dogs as possible before moving around. After all, even if we manage to get the car moving, we're still going to have to transition the rest of our group from inside the house to inside the vehicle. And that's going to be pretty difficult to do with 50 fucking attack dogs tearing us limb from limb. I would see if I could find some poison to pour on the dog's carcass before setting it out for the pack to feed on, and then leave them a big bowl of antifreeze to wash it down with. Don't ask me how I know this, but enough ethylene glycol will put down anything that walks, crawls, swims, or flies. Even if it doesn't kill them outright, after a few hours, they'll be way too compromised to pose any kind of threat. If we can't get a hold of any dangerous household chemicals, we could always just bait them in and pick them off with a bow from up on the roof. Sure, we might have to draw straw to see who gets the honor of retrieving arrows between waves, but killing any amount of these things is going to be a net positive for us in the long run. Once we get to the car, we should immediately roll up all the windows completely, including the sunroof. Auto glass is bound to be much sturdier than what's being used in the house, and they won't get much of a running start from inside the garage. The fact that there's still power going to the starter is a miracle, considering this thing hasn't been run in over 10 years. The dogs aren't going to eat their way into the cab with us, so we might as well take full advantage of that supernatural battery life and crank on this thing until it goes click. Although, we'll want to be careful not to flood the engine in the process. I'd definitely have made sure to bring
bring some kind of weapon with me for when this harebrained scheme ultimately went to shit. Most dogs aren't known for their climbing ability, so while we're waiting for our friends to formulate an exit strategy, I'd be slashing and stabbing at anything that gets near the ledge. And regarding our escape route, we should have had the extra rope tied onto the handlebars from the very beginning, in case Nikki needed to make a quick getaway, or we needed to send someone in after her. Waiting until after things fell apart cost us an arrow, and nearly cost us one of our teammates. Props to John for redeeming himself on a moving target, but we really could have used that accuracy when the dogs were still looking for a way into the garage. Or, you know, when that one had a hold of Nikki's leg. As nightfall rolls around, the gang breaks into the wine cellar and gets ready to fire up the record player. But before they can pop off like it's 1969, the circuit breaker in the basement trips and knocks out the power. Since he's already done it once on this trip, Noah boldly volunteers to brave into the dark, dank underground and flip the breaker, insisting the others just stay put and relax. Armed with nothing but a flashlight and his good intentions, Noah descends into the basement and quickly restores the power, only for it to shut off once again just a few seconds later. As he goes back to check the fuse box, he hears something moving around in a nearby ventilation shaft. There's no sign of anything at first, but a low growl stops him in his tracks. Before Noah can react, a dog springs through the metal grate and knocks him on his ass. He tries desperately to keep the beast at bay, but by the time Matt and John arrive on the scene, it's already too late. A full-blown furry blitzkrieg descends upon the house, with the four remaining friends working frantically to keep the doors and windows secure. The combined might of all the dogs proves to be more than the old construction can handle, and eventually, they're forced to make a hasty retreat up to the attic. Along the way, Matt gets jumped by a sneaky boy hiding in one of the upstairs bedrooms, but John is able to knock it away before he winds up like poor Noah. Do I even need to mention how dumb it is to be going anywhere alone right now? Yeah, it's uh, really fucking dumb. We should be doing everything in at least groups of two, and every one of us should be armed at all times. Matt and John are the most familiar with the layout of this place, and even they haven't been here since they were kids, so we shouldn't assume we know all the ins and outs like the back of our hand. Now is probably not a good time to be tying one on. The dogs could attack in force at any time, and we have no way of knowing whether our hasty fortifications will be able to hold them back. Speaking of which, if it were my ass on the line here, I'd want more than an ancient wooden door keeping me from getting mauled. We should have barricaded ourselves in with whatever we could find, well before the sun ever went down. After the power went out a second time, we should have just admitted defeat and gone back upstairs. Noah is a damn fool for leaning in to investigate the source of the noise. There's only two things that it could possibly be, and both of them are killer canines. I would have kept either the mag light or the wine bottle cocked back and ready to swing at the first sign of trouble, but getting back to our friends should have been the top priority. In this case, curling up into a ball and screaming our lungs out might have been a better move than trying to fight off the dog empty-handed. Sure, it's gonna hurt like hell, but it'll keep us alive long enough for Matt and John to come down and handle business. Once all hell breaks loose, we need to immediately fall back to a more defensible position. The attic is a great choice, but we should have kept the staircase pulled down for just such an occasion. Now would be a great time to channel our inner Obi-Wan and butcher a few of these mutts while we have the high ground. They can't exactly fly up the stairs, and they'll be extremely vulnerable while they're slowly funneled in. This is of course assuming we had the foresight to bring weapons with us or stage some here ahead of time, which unfortunately doesn't seem to be the case. The group settles in for the night as the rest of the house gets completely torn to shit. While poking around through some old boxes, Matt finds some documents linking the old dog train facility on the island to the Army Mountain Combat School, which probably wasn't all that concerned with turning out dogs for the blind. The next morning, they leave the attic to find the place has really gone to the dogs. Seeing no sign of Fido, Matt and John make for the old garage to take another pass at their uncle's old Mercedes. Attempting a push start, Matt muscles the vehicle from behind while John steers. Unfortunately, their efforts don't go unnoticed. With the car now rolling freely downhill, Matt climbs onto the roof and asks John to pass him the boat which he almost immediately drops as soon as they reach the first turn. Matt climbs down into the cab, but they're quickly running at a slope to roll on. In a last-ditch effort to start the engine, John jerks the wheel hard to the left, running the car down a steep incline towards a sheer cliff. Just as they're about to go out like Thelma and Luis, the engine roars to life and John stomps on the brakes, bringing them to a full stop mere feet from certain death. Before they can reach the house, a lurking doggo pounces on Matt through his open window. Thinking quickly, John tells Matt to hold the dog while he swerves into a nearby post, clotheslining the dog and sending it through the air like a frisbee. Nikki meets them as they pull up
up to the porch. It seems Sarah's refusing to leave the house for some reason. John heads inside to try and tuck her down, finding her in a semi-catatonic state. As he forces her to her feet against her will, a lone dog comes out of nowhere to block their escape. Sarah locks eyes with the beast, keeping it at bay while John climbs out the window. Suddenly, she lets out a scream in the dog's attack, knocking John off the second floor onto the ground below. In the ensuing struggle, Sarah and the dog fall through another window, impaling themselves on the busted merry-go-round sitting beside the house. Yeah, who the hell just leaves that lying around? We should be extra careful when leaving the attic, as there's no way of knowing if the house is really empty. I'd make some noise before climbing down to see if any dogs came running into a investigate. Probably best to leave the bow behind on this one. If things go sideways, we can't exactly run and shoot at the same time. It'd be better to have some melee weapons, like the baseball bat or fire pokers, for close encounters. Also, what's with this casually walking BS? This is a matter of life and death. Move your f***ing asses. It makes sense to go for a push start when it won't turn over otherwise, but nothing says you can only push from behind. John and Matt should both be pushing from the open door frames to build up as much speed as possible. This allows them both to quickly jump back in, which is pretty damn important since getting left behind would be certain death. I'm not sure why Matt wouldn't just immediately climb down into the cab where it's safe. Unless you're a Mongolian warrior, hitting moving targets from a moving platform with a bow and arrow is probably out of your skill range. This blunder just cost us one of our best weapons against the dogs without even scratching off a single one. I don't think I'd risk steering straight towards a cliff. A far better option would be to just roll up all the windows and sit tight while the dogs knock their teeth out trying to break in. Just like Nikki earlier, we're pretty much completely safe inside the car so we could just hold out until they get bored or the girls draw them away, and then try another push start when the coast is clear. On that note, roll up the goddamn window. How the hell is this not the very first thing that you do once you get inside? Now that we've got the car running, it seems the engine noise is effective at scaring off the dogs. We should use this to our advantage, and swing back around to grab the bow before collecting our friends. I don't know if Sarah's just accepted death, or if she's actively trying to get us all killed, but it shouldn't be just John going up to get her. We need to stay together as much as possible, so either all three of us are going up there, or she's getting left behind. The way John and Sarah handled the dog makes absolutely no sense. It's not like it's holding a broadsword. Just double team him and get the hell out of there. He would have to have known that leaving her alone with a bloodthirsty attack dog was going to end poorly, with or without her landing on the playground equipment. Now down to only three, Matt, John, and Nikki head to the old dog training facility to try and find a way to call for help. They hop the fence and head inside quickly finding an old bite suit, along with evidence suggesting the place was actually used to breed some kind of super dog. After restoring power to the building, the lab's only radio proves inoperable, so John MacGyvers their brick phone up to a comms array to try and boost the signal. Problem is, at some point, the giant radio antenna was disconnected from the rest of the system. John volunteers to make the repair, instructing the others on how to use the equipment before casually jogging out into the open. Once up on the tower, John spots Luke and Jenny's boat docked off in the distance. He reconnects the wires and signals back to Nikki to fire up the transmitter, but the resulting power surge knocks him flat on his back, in addition to sparking a massive electrical fire down in the basement. Suddenly, John finds himself surrounded on all sides by snarling dogs. He quickly becomes ensnared in a vicious bout of tug of war, but before they can rip him in half like a teddy bear, Matt shows up in the bite suit to teach them how they played fetch in Soviet Russia. Meanwhile, Nikki lures part of the pack into the burning building near an open propane tank. Just when it looks like they have her cornered, she opens the basement door, using the backdraft from the fire below to fry up a few hot dogs. The resulting explosion drives away most of the dogs, but before long, they return in full force to finish where they started. John and Matt sit and await a grisly fate as human kibble, but just then, Nikki comes tearing through the compound in the Mercedes to save the day. The brothers quickly pile in and point her towards the dock. In the car's final moments, the three catch air off the raised pier and slam into the water water beside the boat. Matt, John, and Nikki frantically scramble aboard and cast off, narrowly escaping the mob closing in behind them. As the three survivors triumphantly sail off into the sunset, John opens the cabin door. From out of the darkness, one last dog leaps out at him, only to most likely get punted off into the ocean. Do they really think this dog would end all three of them on a boat by itself? Is that really what we're assuming happens here? Alright, let's rewind. Before any of us go blindly hopping over that wire, it might be a good idea to 
sweep the perimeter to make sure the place isn't just a massive den. The dogs have had years to dig their way under the fence, so we shouldn't assume the place is anywhere close to airtight. It would also be a good idea to have one of us stay behind in the car in case we need emergency extraction. The fact that none of them thought to immediately don the bite suit makes me want the dogs to win. It's a literal dog-proof suit of f***ing armor. There's no way I'm passing this thing up. We should also take the opportunity to search for any other training devices, like dog whistles or cattle prods. Given the age of this place, I'm surprised that simply restoring the power didn't cause a fire. And I have no idea why a colossal f**k-up like John would know how to rig up a cell phone to an antiquated radio system. But yeah, good for you, dude. That said, since he's the one guy who knows how to properly work the communications, someone else should be going out to screw around with the antenna. Sure, he gives them a two-second breakdown, but if he wants up dog food and something else goes wrong with the radio, Matt and Nikki are pretty much SOL. Either way, whoever goes outside should be carrying the baseball bat and wearing the bite suit. We'll also want to get ourselves clear of the tower before signaling Nikki to flip the equipment. That shit's had years to corrode in the elements, so there's no telling how many dead shorts could be present throughout the circuit. John's just lucky the hard zapping he took didn't stop his heart. Good on Matt for stepping in to save his brother's life, even if it was a losing battle to begin with. That said, while John's got them distracted, now would be the perfect time to sneak over to the Mercedes. That way, we could easily clear away the dogs and get John to safety without risking a literal ass chewing. Of course, blowing yourself up to kill a whopping three dogs is also an option. Seriously, how the hell did Nikki walk away from that? The explosion blew the f***ing roof off. She should be crispier than Freddy Krueger right now. Whatever the case, her respawning next to the vehicle is the only reason Matt and John live to make more bad decisions. Now that John knows about the boat, the next move is obvious, but instead of ditching our best defense against the doggos in the bottom of the ocean, we should let it idle at the pier to get out before diving in. Pulling that Nitro Circus bullshit only risks us being injured on impact. Plus, if there's something wrong with the boat that keeps us from leaving, it'd be nice to have another option besides getting brutally torn apart back on the dock. Once we're on board, I can't blame them for cutting away without taking the time to search the hole, but once we're safely away from shore, we should probably find something sharp and clear the cabin. As long as we don't jump overboard at the sight of a single dog like we did with Sarah, we should be able to handle ourselves just fine. In the end, this is one of those rare occasions where everyone could have probably survived if they bothered to pull their heads out of their asses for any amount of time. For starters, Luke and Jenny should have realized early on that this was not a safe place to land, much less go stumbling drunk through the forest. As for the five friends, had they left to seek medical attention for Sarah like a group of non-psychopaths, this whole mess would hardly even be a memory ten years down the road. Otherwise, all they had to do was arm up and stick together to ensure none of them could ever be isolated enough to wind up as easy prey. Ultimately, I think the hellhounds from The Breed were beaten. How would you have beaten The Breed? Let me know in the comments. Hit the like button to airdrop some ambient laced snossages. And don't forget to subscribe for more science experiments gone wrong. Thanks for watching, and remember, you only have to outrun your slowest friend. And remember to elevate your status by going to establishedtitles.com slash nerdexplains. Mm.